So I guess first off, just um, tell us kind of how you got into hunting and you know, how you got into to, to ducks and carving and who taught you and your name, inspiration. My name too? Yep, yep. <laughs> Roe Ro Terry, call me the duck man, uh, home port, Shinkatick Island, Virginia. Been here pretty much all my life, uh, close to it. I've uh, been carving 52 years, the old style way with a, with a hatchet. Go from the bandsaw to the hatchet, chopping them out. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I was uh, pretty much raised by a very well-known carver, Doug Jester Jr. I went over one day and uh, introduced myself. Well, I introduced myself, they tell me around four years old. I uh, didn't remember that part of it too much. Doug was a waterman, uh, like his father was, and a decoy carver. And uh, he had a little chopping block out in the backyard, and. He was chopping away at this block of wood, just like that. And I said, Captain, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a duck stool, a decoy to hunt with. And I said, what do you mean you're making it? He said, I'm using a hatchet and a block of wood and I'm gonna make a head and glue it together and put a balance weight on it. And I'm gonna hunt ducks with it. And I said, well, you can go down to the hardware store and buy them for a dollar and a half a piece out of plastic. And he said, boy, it just ain't the same thing. So I watched him, and I kept watching him and watching him. And I was 15 years old, I'll never forget it. He cut me out some little miniatures about three inches long, and a little scroll saw, a little band saw he had there. And he said, take these home and make them. And I said, well, how do you make them? He gives me a knife, and he says, you cut away everything that doesn't look like a duck. And he laughed about it. He was a gentle giant. Wasn't a real big guy, but he had arms like Arnold Schwarzenegger from working on the water all his life. Hard as a rock, big barrel laugh. So uh, I took it home and I made these little miniatures up. And next thing you knew, I was selling them. Uh, I was selling them in a restaurant in the, in the glass case where you check out. And I told the owner, I said, can I sell these little birds in your glass case? <clears throat> he said, how much you get for them? I said, I get $2 a piece. But if you let me sell them in here, I'll give you, I'll give you a quarter on each one. I'll bump them up to, to $2.25. This was about 1968. So he laughed and he put them in his little glass case. And at the end of the week, I'd go there and he'd have me $8, $9, $10. Well, I was in 68, I was just about rich. $5 a week for allowance, $10 worth of ducks. Man, I couldn't, I couldn't have it any better. So I just kept carving and carving and never thought it would turn out to be what it is now, today. I've been carving 52 years. Um, I carved all through high school. I went to Navy boot camp. I went to A school, carved in A school. I went down to submarine, I carved on a sub. Well, I tried to. I never realized how dark it was gonna be on a sub. <clears throat> so that didn't pan out too good. Uh, carved my whole Navy days, my whole four years. Came out and, uh, and went to work for, for NOAA, National Oceanic Atmosphere Administration, tracking satellites. I had some electronics training. So that kind of helped me. And uh, I stayed there about four and a half years. Didn't like it. I just didn't like working for somebody else. So I came home, I said, honey, I'm going to quit my job. And I'm going to carve ducks for a little. We just built a brand new house. I had two kids. She said, if you do, I'm going to leave you. Which meant if I quit, she was going to leave me. Well, the book I was written up by a very well-known carver named William Veazey, world-class carver, instructor. He did a book on me. I put me in his book back in the 80s, and one of the chapters in the book said, I did and she didn't, <clears throat> which meant I quit, but she didn't leave me. Thank God. So I came out here, and in nine and a half years, I made 5,751 pieces. I had to write every one of them down so I could show her that I could make a living carbon ducks. So I was working 12, 16, 18 hours a day. But uh, I 
put ducks in every contest, working decoys, put them in every contest in the country. I flew in California, I entered a contest out there. I carved out there, I did a show, I was a judge. Well, nine years and nine months later, this old man was tired of carving ducks. I beat my hands to pieces. I uh, ended up having to get rotator cuff surgery on both shoulders. So nine years and nine months later, I tell people I should be a motivational speaker for young kids. These young hardheads in college that think they're going to run the world. Well, get you a degree in something, electronics, plumber, carpenter, something. Photography, there's always going to be a job for you. So I went back to Noah. I said, I want my job back. And they kind of laughed. And they said, we don't have any openings right now. But because I was a certified electronics technician, I didn't have to take another test for civil service or anything. And when the job opened up, they called me back. And it was just under 10 years I was gone. And I went back to Noah. And I stayed there for another 15, 18 years. And combined with my military time, I walked out of there with something called health insurance and a retirement. My God, what a great world we live in. When you're young, you don't know about health insurance. You don't know about retirement. You think you're going to live forever. You think mommy and daddy's going to wipe your ass all your life. And guess what? They might not be there someday. So, I got my retirement and I wanted to sail back into the twilight. The problem is, I had built up such a clientele that I had to keep carving. And now, a total of 52 years later, I got a good bunch of people buying my ducks. I learned from people like Doug Jester Jr., Cigar Daisy, Delper Cigar Daisy, he was a master. Um, Bobby Umflett, a uh, good old buddy of mine. Back then, nobody taught anything about carving. They would, they would learn you. You would, because when you got done watching them and talking to them, they'd say, did you learn anything? They weren't there to teach. They didn't want to, these old timers didn't want to sit back and have a youngin running around their feet all day long. If you've ever seen the movie Misty, which made Chincote famous, uh, it was filmed with a guy named Miles Hancock as the old carver. And Paul and Ring Beebe wanted to make some extra money to buy a hoss. So they uh, so they went to Mr. Miles and he put him to work cleaning up shavings and stuff. But he didn't really, you know, it gave you a good essence of what an old time carver looked like and how they acted. So I go to a lot of old carvers like Mr. Miles, and I'd wash them. But if I'd say, teach me something, he'd say, boy, I ain't got time for that mess. But you can watch me and learn something. Well, if you wanted to learn it, you sat there with your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open, and you learned something. And I guess I learned too damn much. Because I watched him do this with a hatchet. It's a very dangerous tool. I do not... I do not teach this at all. You can watch me, I'll tell you anything about it, but I'm not gonna send you home to chop your fingers off. I haven't chopped them off yet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna knife. Ain't no to it. So from there, I go to this little contraption here. Mr. Miles Hancock had one of these in his shop. I never noticed it, never remember seeing him use it. But my God, it's a lifesaver. You go from the, this point of the knife to this point, just like you would, just like you would a knife. When I'm carving it, this is the way you want to carve. You never push the blade through it, that's how you carve. So, Instead of using this, you make them with two hands, and I can pretty much just let my thumb guide it along. And you, 
You can actually take a lot of wood off with a sign. And again, I'll show anybody who ever wants to come here, if they want to learn how to do this, I'll be happy to show them free of charge. I'm not going to set up appointments for them. I'm not going to let them say, well, I'll be by Mr. Terry at 8 o'clock on the 17th. I don't want to be obligated to nobody for nothing except you guys. But as far as making a certain, certain hour to teach you how to carve, to learn you something, no. Those days are done. I don't punch a clock no more. I used to come out here about 8 o'clock, then it went to 8.30, then 9. 9.30. Now, if I don't feel like coming out here at all, <laughs> I don't come out at all. If you want you a cold beer or something, that refrigerator solid full of them, help yourself. I can put my flat screen TV on and watch the news. I got me a brand new Bose radio for Christmas. I can sit back and drink a beer and take a nap. My wife won't even know it. Sick of carving ducks? Damn right I am. If I never made another one, I wouldn't care. The only good part about it is the money. And that's the only thing keeping me going. I didn't have any money for a long time when I was growing up. Did a lot of crappy jobs. So now, I'm doing what I like to do. The problem is I'm just about wore out. Well, that's one half of the bird done. And that's the way the back half will be. I'll mash them up with a hand carved head. That'll be a red breasted merganser when he's done. When I get done, with this draw knife, I'll put it on the bandsaw and I'll run it across the bandsaw. Nothing up my sleeve, wrong bird. But I'll run it across the bandsaw and I'll slice off about three quarters of an inch off the bottom. Flip that off, draw a line in here, go to my drill press. I use an inch and a quarter German Forstner bit. Lay it down and I bring that down and I hollow the whole thing out. You hollow them out for two reasons. This is air dried wood. This is called cottonwood, polonia. It's got water in it. It doesn't have sap. A lot of woods like pine, cedar, they do have sap. I can't get it kiln dried. I get it air dried. When I make the bird, I hollow it out. I want all the moisture out of the wood. If you seal that bird, that wood, that wood with paint, you're going to seal it, and it's got moisture in it, that moisture is going to try to come out someday. So you're going to have little cracks, checks, sap. So you hollow it out. I put a penny or a screw or a, uh, a washer. I put something inside of it to show people that it is hollowed out. The first reason, again, being to make sure it's dry. The second reason, when I put the head on it, this will be a, a surf scooter. And when I glue that head on, when I throw it out in the water at 4 or 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, when it hits upside down, I'm going to attach a bar weight, a lead bar weight to it, and it's going to be light enough so the counterbalance is going to flip it over. You want more weight below the water than you do above the water. If you've been on a sailboat, you want your sailboat to ride this way, not that way. So you put a lead bar on them, on the bottom of it. You can put a keel on it. This is actually a piece of cork, a cork bird. I put a keel on it and a lead weight. On this bird, I like the, the big cork birds. I like to put a keel on them. It does make them float good, but also you got a handle. When you wrap the string back around it, it's a pretty heavy bird.
This is called a shelf where you put the neck on. And this would be what they call an ice groove down the back. Normally, if it was raining and freezing and it gets water in the back, uh, it turns to ice. So the old timers used to make what they call an ice groove down the back. I'll chisel right out. You don't see me when I miss with this hammer and hit that thumb. Woo! Not good. Yeah, I take one of my heavier knives. And again, you can use grinding tools, what I call a fordable tool, to do all this. But that's not the way I was taught. I was taught with a hand knife. And, uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm gonna use till the day I die. I haven't started just grinding yet, but there's nothing wrong with it. Some people are better better at using a a machine tool, a grinder than other people. They feel more comfortable with it. This is why the apron is all cut up. You're supposed to hit the apron and not the skin. It worked out pretty good so far. Well, again, we were talking about my mentors, uh, some of the early carvers of Shingatig, who really inspired me. And uh, I'd really be remiss if I hadn't brought some of these out of the house uh, to, to show you some of the talent these gentlemen had. Mr. Mr. Miles Hancock uh, made his Canada Goose probably back in the probably back in the fifties. Um, not a really fancy bird at all, but something that he used for his market hunting days. Uh, this was a working tool where he would go out and shoot hundreds of ducks and ship them to the put them on the railway and ship them to the city to make money. Um, Ira Hudson, really early bluebill here. Again, making one of these birds in, in probably half a day. But uh, Ira Hudson birds now are bringing upwards of twenty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a piece. These were uh, these were working tools. These were these were made to actually bring the bird in. They went to work in in the, in the morning and they they shot the ducks and they brought them home. If they broke the heads off them, they threw them in the corner. Now today, you know, they were paying. 50 cents a piece back, back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, and now they're they're really a collectible item. Delbert Cigar Daisy. Uh, this is probably late 60s, early 70s. Um, I probably spent more time with with what they call Cigar Daisy uh, than anybody. I just acquired this bird at auction a week ago. Um, a nice little bird, nothing fancy again, but when when Sig did it. Uh, that was his rendition of a bucklehead, and it did the job. Uh, last of all, but not but not least, Doug Jester, a uh, little hen bucklehead, half of a, a horseshoe for a weight. These birds, they put anything on them when they threw them in the water, upside down. They wanted to make sure they flipped over and did the job. Uh, his son is is the gentleman that taught me to carve. That took me under his wing. Uh, back in the 60s, and it was because of, of Doug Jester Jr. that I became a carver. Found this bird after the 1962 flood. March storm here on Shake Tape. Had it ever since. That's about uh, some of the main people to carve. Uh, one other, Dave Umbrella Watson, was a very famous carver here uh, down the shore, Northampton County. Uh, Cobb Island. Birds bringing eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars. Just a uh, every one individually made and made how they thought the bird looked, and nobody ever thought they would become 
go from a working decoy to a piece of art, a collectible bird, a collectible item. This is one of my one of my favorite birds. It's a ring neck. Uh, I'm kind of kind of getting known now for making birds and with motion in a swimming position. Uh, when you put that bird out in the water, you've got that head. He's pushing water. You've got his head cocked a little bit. Uh, he's kind of going through the water, and it just gives him some motion to him. I'm trying to make like one of every BC. That way, this is a this is what they call a gadwall. It's a puddle duck. Uh, that was a diving duck. The ring neck. They feed um, in deeper water. The little puddle ducks. They tip up when they eat. I've only made a about a half a dozen of these gadwalls. But these do go in the water. Everything you see in the shop gets hunted over. This bird floated behind my house. We had four feet of water all over the island. That bird floated behind my house during the storm. And Doug Jester Sr. made it. And after the tide went down, made out of the whole Navy life raft, old balsa wood. After the tide went down, I was nine years old. And Doug come up to my house, I said, I said, Doug, all these duck stools have been floating by from people's sheds and stuff to walk to washed away. He said, when the tide goes down, we'll go out in the woods and we'll find some. And we found that bird in 1962. And his dad would have made it. So I've kept it ever since. Yeah, he was he's a very, very good friend. So it's it's like a Somebody calls up and says, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm making hair heads, which we call, a, you know, people call it hooded McGazzer, we call them hair heads. That's my trademark bird. That's my favorite bird to make. That's my, that's my drink, hooded McGazzer. Uh, I started doing him with his, with his head way up and that crest, and I started rolling those hairs in the back like a wavy head. And I started doing those first, as far as I know. For this type of bird. That's my favorite bird. So I'll say I'm doing a couple hooded mergansers, a couple hair heads. We already sold yet? Well, no, not yet. Tom wants them, then Bill wants one, and Dan wants it, and George wants it. So I gotta kinda figure out who's gonna get the next bird when I make them. Again, it's a good thing. I'm very, very fortunate. 84. First wooden brand I ever did. He ain't that pretty, but he's but he's mine. Some people say that about their youngins. He ain't pretty <laughs> looking at these mine. I made this bird in 70. I made that bird in 1970. I made that one in 72 or 73. 70. The one that I just bought on the internet was made in 71. And most people wouldn't even recognize that I made it. So I'm collecting, I don't know anything about the stock market, but I know ducks. 